Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. It's good to see each of you today. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you as we begin this morning. The first one is, can you tell me some things that are holy? The Sabbath is holy. Okay. What else? God is holy. The Bible is holy. Jesus is holy. The church or the tabernacle is holy. Anything else that was mentioned? Pardon? The lamb or Jesus that was mentioned. How about frogs or toads? Snakes or dogs? You know, how about water? The reason I'm saying that is uh, when I was living in Chicago, every year the Archbishop of Chicago would come out and people would bring their rats, bats, snakes, dogs, cats, whatever animal they had, and they would be lined up for blocks and blocks so that they could be sprinkled with holy water. What is it that makes those things we just mentioned holy? God himself. Holiness comes solely from a connection with God. Now, should there be then marked distinctions between that which is holy and that which is not holy? Most definitely. And I want you to see today, as we go back to the book of Leviticus, what happens when we lose sight of that um, distinction between the holy and the unholy, between the sacred and the secular. In the book of Leviticus, let's go to the 10th chapter of Leviticus this morning. Leviticus chapter 10, and I'm going to begin with verse 1 of this chapter. It's an interesting account here of two men who knew but refused to do. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people will I be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Next to Moses and Aaron, these two men, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, had the highest positions in Israel. They were the sons of the high priest. They ministered in the sanctuary of God. They had been especially honored by the Lord, having been permitted, along with the 70 elders, to behold the glory of God on the mount. But their, trans- their transgression here was not to be excused or lightly regarded. All these high privileges that they had rendered their sin far more grievous. You see, because men have great light, because they have, like the princes of Israel, ascended to the mount and been privileged to have communion with God and to dwell in the light of his glory, let these folk not flatter themselves that they can afterwards sin with impunity. That because they have been so honored... God will not be strict to punish their iniquity. This is a fatal deception to think that because of the blessings you have in the Lord, it will allow you to do things that the Lord has forbidden to do. The great light and privileges bestowed, my friends, upon individuals requires returns of virtue and holiness corresponding to the light that is given. And anything short of this, God will not accept. Great blessings or privileges should never 
lull one to security or carelessness. They should never give license to sin or cause the recipients to feel that God will not be exact with them. God is a very particular God. And Nadab and Abihu would never have committed this fatal sin had they not first become intoxicated. They understood that the most careful, solemn preparation was necessary before presenting themselves in the sanctuary where the divine presence was manifested. But by intemperance, they were disqualified now for their holy office. Their minds had become confounded and confused and their moral perceptions had become dulled so that they could not discern between the difference between the sacred and the common. Now these sons of Aaron had not in their youth been trained in self-control. There was the first big problem in their lives, just as we saw with Eli's sons. They had not been raised in habits of self-control and habits of self-indulgence now, being long cherished, obtained a hold upon these young men, which even the responsibility of the most sacred office did not have the power to break. You see, they had not been taught to respect the authority of their father. And they did not realize the necessity of exact obedience to the requirements of God. And so Aaron's mistaken indulgence of his sons prepared them to become the subjects of divine judgment. God designed in this event that took place here to teach the people that they must approach him with reverence and with awe and in his own appointed manner. I hear so many people today say, oh, you worship God your way and I'll worship God my way. And when they tell me that, I just tell them, no, you worship God your way and I'll worship God his way. It isn't my way, your way. It's man's way or God's way, and we have to decide which it will be. You see, God cannot accept partial obedience. <clears throat> it was not enough that in this solemn worship of God, nearly everything was done the way that God had commanded. So let no one deceive himself or herself with the belief that a part of God's requirements are non-essential or that he will accept a substitute for that which he has required. You want to see how particular he is? Just go back to the Garden of Eden. One bite of one piece of fruit is God particular. You see, God is very particular when you go through the scriptures. Drop down to verse 10 in this same chapter, verses 6 and 7 here in chapter 10. It says, And Moses said unto Aaron and to Eliezer, and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest what? You die, and lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Here we see that the father of those slain, Aaron himself and the other two brothers, are forbidden to manifest any signs of grief for the ones who had been justly punished by God. When Moses reminded Aaron of the words of the Lord that he would be sanctified in them that came nigh him, Aaron remained silent. He knew that God was just and he did not murmur against him. You see, his heart was grieved as any father's heart would be grieved at the dreadful death of his sons 
while they were in disobedience of all things. Yet according to God's command, he made no expression of sorrow, lest by doing so he should share the same fate as his sons, and the congregation also be infected with the spirit of unreconciliation, and God's wrath would come upon all of Israel. For Aaron to have shown signs of grief would have been to sympathize with his sons against the judgments of God. You see, when the Israelites committed sin and God punished them for their transgression and the people mourned for the fate of the one punished, instead of sorrowing because God had been dishonored, the sympathizers were accounted equally guilty with the transgressor. And the Lord teaches us very clearly in the directions that were given to Aaron here that his people are to at all times acknowledge the justice of his correction that others may also fear. In these last days, many, many people are liable to be self-deceived and they are unable to see the wrongs in their own lives. And if God, through his servants, reproves and rebukes the erring, there are always those who are ready to sympathize with those who deserve punishment and reproof. They will seek to lighten the burden which God compelled his servants to lay upon the guilty. And these sympathizers... They think that they are performing a virtuous act by sympathizing with the one at fault, whose course may have even greatly injured the cause of God. And such folk are deceived. They are only arraying themselves against God's servants who have done his will and against God himself. And they are therefore equally guilty with the transgressor. Remember, there are many erring souls who might have been saved if they had not been deceived by receiving false sympathy from the brethren. It goes on in verses 9 and 10 down there. And God tells them that they need to put a difference between the holy and between the unclean and clean. The holy and the unholy and the clean and the unclean. God is particular because if there is not a distinction between these things, then not only are the people going to be led into sin, but God himself will be profaned among the people. Uh, take your Bibles and go to the book of Ezekiel for a moment here. The book of Ezekiel, and we'll go to the 22nd chapter of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is way back there by Daniel. So it's quite a ways back in the Bible. And Ezekiel chapter 22. And take a look at what God says in verse 6 of Ezekiel 22. <clears throat> Her priests have violated my law and have profaned what? My holy things. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. And neither have they showed a difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. And I am what? I am profaned among them. You see how clear this is? When we do not make that marked distinction and live within those distinctions and be willing to follow God, we profane His holy name. And we'll look at more of this in a week or two here. You see, in Isaiah, the scripture reading this morning from Isaiah 6, and, and uh, I was amazed that, that that was the one that Brett chose this morning. Brett chose our scripture reading. And uh, and I want you to go back to that passage, Isaiah, the sixth chapter this morning. <clears throat> and I want you to see what God says here about himself. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, and starting with verse one. 
Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You see, in that year of the king, the prophet Isaiah was given a view right into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He sees God on the throne. He sees the temple filled with all of the glory of God. And then it goes on in verse 3. It's talking about these angels that are talking to one another. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, when Isaiah saw that, he later says, Woe am I, for I am undone. This is down in verse 5. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. As Isaiah beheld this revelation of the glory and majesty of his Lord, he was overwhelmed by the sense of his purity and holiness. God so pure and holy on that throne. And how sharp the contrast between the matchless perfection of God, of the creator of heaven and earth, and the sinful course of those who with himself had long been numbered among the chosen people of Israel and Judah. Woe is me. I'm undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But nevertheless, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He had such an overwhelming understanding of the holiness of God there. But people today have no true conception of God's holiness, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts and their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's will and in need of a server, Savior. All of these things people must be taught. They must come to see that they and God are different. He is holy. He wants us to be holy. He calls us into a whole different way of viewing him and ourselves. But what faint, faint views most of us have of his holiness. How much today God's people take his holy and reverend name in vain. Without realizing that it is God, the great and terrible God of whom they are speaking in their conversations. Even while praying. Many use careless and irreverent expressions which grieve the tender spirit of the Lord and cause their petitions to be shut out of heaven. So very few have no just concept of the purity and holiness of God or of their own guilt and uncleanness. God's people today have no true conviction of sin and feel no true repentance we were discussing this Raymond was leading out today in the class back there the need of repentance be zealous therefore and repent and that that repentance can only come from God and it'll only come from God when we realize his holiness and our great need of forgiveness and so people not seeing their lost condition as violators of God's law, they do not realize that they have a great need for the atoning blood of Jesus. And the hope of salvation is today accepted by many without a radical change of heart or reformation in life. The hope of salvation they want but they don't want to change in their life. And this superficial conversion abound and multitudes are joined to the church which have never been united to Christ. 
In Revelation, the fourth chapter, John sees these heavenly beings there and they are crying out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Every time you see these heavenly beings, they're proclaiming the holiness of God. And yet these angels are themselves holy, are they not? The holy angels we refer to. But in the presence of God, all they can see is his marvelous holiness. Moses is out there in the middle of the Midian desert. And one day as he had been attending his sheep, he looks up and he sees a strange fire on the mountain. And he goes up there and it says that he turned aside to see what this strange thing was. And it was a burning bush. And as he approached this burning bush rather cautiously, I know I would if I'm in the middle of nowhere and see a bush burning, but it's not being burned up, I would be walk walking steps way out around it trying to figure out what's going on. And that's what Moses was probably doing, stepping out around that bush and checking it out, what's happening. And then out of the midst of that fire comes the voice of God. Put off the shoes from off thy feet. For the place where thou standest is holy ground. A dirty, rocky mountain. But it was holy ground because God was there. And where God is, holiness will be. That is true in our lives. If God is there, holiness will be there. But that's another subject for the future. You see, the burning bush in which the Lord's presence was there did not consume away. The fire did not extinguish one fiber of its branches. <clears throat> and thus, my friends, it will be with the feeble human agent who puts his trust in God. The furnace fire of temptation may burn, persecution and trial may come, but only the dross will be consumed and the gold will shine brighter because of this process of purification. You see, Christ has promised to dwell in the heart of those who receive him by faith. And though trials may come upon the soul, yet the Lord's presence will be with us. Greater is he that is in the heart of the faithful than he that controls the heart of unbelievers. <clears throat> Complain not bitterly of the trial which may come upon you, my friends, but let your eyes be directed to Christ, who is clothed in his divinity and with humanity, in order that we might understand how great our Savior is and he can manifest himself as one with us. In Exodus 19, I want you to go back to Exodus and look at another passage back here. Exodus, the 19th chapter. And I want to begin reading with verse 11. Not only was that little bush on that mountain holy, but when the children of Israel came back to that mountain and gathered around the base of the mountain, I want you to see what God said, beginning with verse 11, Exodus 19. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. You see that? Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or, slot or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live when the trumpet sounds long and they shall come up to the mount. Everything 
connected with God was holy. His presence made that whole mountain holy now. And you couldn't even come up to the border of it without dying. Was God particular? Was God particular when he said not one person should put their hand on the ark? And others that thought, oh, I'm going to save it from falling. Even though his intentions may have been good, his action was fatal. God is very particular. And there in that wilderness, God had to make him a sanctuary. And everything in that sanctuary, including the very apparel and deportment of the priest, was to be such an, as to impress the beholder with a sense of the holiness of God and the sacredness of his worship and the purity that is required of those who come in to his presence. This is important that we understand this, friends. The purity and the holiness of God is the great subject which must be awakened in our hearts to the sense of bringing about a true conversion experience. While on the one hand, danger lurks for the people of God in a narrow philosophy and a hard, cold rule of orthodoxy. In other words, legalism. Danger lurks there in legalism. But on the other hand, there is great danger in the careless, impure liberalism that is so rampant today. When we approach God, we must always do so realizing that God is holy. And wherever he's at, and that is within the confines of this wall, he's not locked up in this building, but he is present with us through his spirit. Thus, this building becomes holy. Here a while back, I was talking to some of the young people that were here because one evening there was a lot of noise coming from out there. So much noise that I was surprised that so few people could make that much noise. As I came out of that room going around that way, the further I walked, the more I imagined it being like the golden calf with all of the noise and laughing and carrying on. And there was just very few of them. And I asked them simply, do you know where you're at? Do we know where we're at when we're in the house of God? Jesus, and we'll talk about this later, cleansed the temple two times. At the beginning and the ending of his ministry. And when he cleansed the temple, remember this. It was the outer court that he cleansed. So the whole confines of this building is sacred. And we must remember that when it comes to, to all of the noise and the running and the things that not only we ourselves do, but we allow our children to do. Even in church and vacation Bible school here a few years ago, Every time, and they had some of the meetings in here, and every single time the teacher would keep prompting the kids until they were screaming as loud as they could. In this room here, we should speak with subdued tones. We don't try to see how loud we can get. And if we can't hear the children, then perhaps I can direct you to a place where you can get a good deal on hearing aids. Because my hearing is not the greatest, and I can always hear these kids. And sometimes I just know what my grandparents were talking about when they used to tell me children are meant to be seen and not heard. They can be the sweetest little things to look at. But remember, within the confines of God's church, Holiness unto the Lord should be our motto. Our closing hymn this morning is number 73, 
Holy, holy, holy. Number 70.